What's up guys, this is Heist, and today we're going to take a look at how you actually operate a steam locomotive in first person. I got a bunch of great footage from my trip to Colorado. A lot of it was operating Rear Grand Southern number 20. So we're going to have a camera right above my head so you can see everything I'm doing with the controls in the cab. And we're going to have one right out the front door so you can see what I can see when I'm operating the locomotive. So I know that not everyone who follows the channel knows what everything in the cab of a steam engine does. The beauty of the Colorado at a railroad museum is that it's a circle of tracks, so we get a couple passes and everything. So through the first lap, I'm going to explain what I'm doing, and I'm going to explain what the controls do before we get rolling, and that way you can understand what's going on as we work around the railroad. And then for the second couple laps, I'll just let you sit back and enjoy because the audio is awesome. It, it, I was genuinely surprised at how well the GoPro cameras actually picked up all the different sounds of the engine, so I figured, hey, Let's leave it open for you guys to just listen to what goes on and not listen to me. So before we get going with the video, I have to give a huge thank you to the Colorado Railroad Museum. They let me come out and film all this stuff in addition to coming out and helping out. The museum's a great place, they have a great mission, and they really support Colorado Railroad history. And one of the ways they do that is by having all these steam locomotives operate. Everyone loves to come see a steam engine run in person. So make sure you guys check out the museum's channel. They have some really, really brilliant history on all the equipment there. I love the big train tour series that they've been doing for a while now. They've got history and great old pictures and they they really can teach you about all the different cars and locomotives at the museum and many of which I've personally worked on and helped with so it's cool to learn that other side of things. I personally am there for the, the mechanical engineering piece of it. I love the engineering behind the locomotives and the cars and how things work but the history side of it is something that I always find getting enamored with and getting sucked into just because how cool it is. But anyways, let's get into the cab here and, and go over the controls on the RGS 20. So in the cab of a steam locomotive, there are a lot of things going on. As soon as you see a picture or you see these video clips, there's pipes everywhere, there's valves everywhere, there's all sorts of stuff going on. The critical controls that you need to know about while we're running are the Johnson bar, the throttle, the automatic brake, and the independent brake. And then of course, I guess the whistle is fun too, and then we also use a little bit of sand here and there. So the Johnson bar is the big lever that sticks up and down right in front of you in RGS 20, and with the way that the seats work out, it ends up being nice and tight to you, so it's actually kind of a pain, but that's the joy of deckless engines. When you put it all the way forward, it's kind of like being in first gear, and you've got as much power as you possibly can give, but as you bring it closer and closer to center, or even actually beyond center in the case of 20, because center is actually biased in reverse so that you get more throw forwards, because reasons. As you bring it closer and closer to that center point, you get more and more efficiency and you use less and less steam and you rely more on the expansion of the steam to actually do the work of moving the locomotive. So you're gonna see, as we start out, it'll be all the way forward, and then really quickly, it'll come back closer towards center. The next important control is the throttle, and that's the one that's on top of the boiler and comes out and sticks in front of the engineer. The throttle is a big valve in the steam dome on this locomotive that ultimately delivers steam towards the steam chests. There's a lot of linkage between the dome and then where that lever in the cab is. So frequently throughout this video, you're gonna see me multiple tapping one way or another to try and get a small adjustment out of the throttle. It's pretty easy to move. Jeff did a great job of getting the linkage all set up without binding, but to make a really, really small movement, you really just barely need to tap it around. You'll watch me make a lot of minute adjustments just by giving it a couple little taps where I'm going back and forth in the slop and the pins, because you can move the throttle bar about that far where it doesn't do anything, because you're going to the end of travel of all the pins either one way or the other. So you'll see that I get all the way to that end of travel, and then I go back a little bit and just give it a little bump one way or another, and that can help give you a really, really fine and precise adjustment over what the throttle setting is. The next control is the automatic brake valve, which is kind of up here in the RGS-20, which is not the most convenient, but again, deckless engines. And so, 20 is equipped with A1 brake equipment, which means it has a G6 automatic brake valve that we talked about a little bit in my Air Brakes 101 video. 
But the long and short of it is most of the time it's left in running and then you'll you'll hear a large escape of air when it's in application and then we go back to lap while going downhill to hold the set that we had. Then even behind the automatic back here is the independent brake valve. The independent brake valve on the 20 is an S3 style independent brake valve where you pretty much have one application point that puts full pressure to the independent brake and then you have a running and then bail or release position. And so you'll watch when I want just a little bit of independent brake as we're going down the hill, I'll be bouncing it closer to me to just kind of feather it in to that application zone. Because if you go all the way into that application, you get a full application really quickly. And that's not what I want. I want just enough to hold the engine back without bumping into the cars. You'll see me frequently kind of tapping it in or then tapping it off because I'm trying to make a really slow adjustment in what I'm doing. The only other stuff you'll see in the video as far as controls goes that there's a small valve between the automatic and the independent brake. And that's actually for sand. And starting off, RGS20 is really slippery, so I'll, I'll use a fair amount of sand depending on. I'd watched other engineers run before me and they'd slipped in this one particular spot in the cut, so I made sure that I gave it a little sand there the first time through, and then when we're coming into the station, I also have sand so that we can stop on sand so that you're ready to go for the next run. And then right at this, the first shot, I flick something on, you hear the dynamo load up, and that is turning on the headlight. Okay, so getting started, what you're gonna see is I, I put the Johnson bar all the way forward. We whistle off when the conductor gives us the high ball, and so we get a signal from the rear that says, okay, we're good to proceed. We whistle off twice, and then I open the throttle while I still have the independent brakes set. And that's because we're on about a one and a quarter, one and a half percent grade up leaving the station at the museum when we're going clockwise. So you need to make sure you've got some power on before you release the brakes so that you don't roll first. If you were on level track or if you were going downhill, you could kick the brake off first. But going uphill, you get the steam set a little bit so you get everything kind of tensed up and ready to go. You kick the brake off and off you go. And we get even just a couple chuffs, and I, she starts to get away nice and easy, so I bring the bar back really, really soon, so we're not beating the heck out of the, the valve gear. Because when it's all the way in the corner and getting the most travel it can, the steam's really abusive of those pins and bushings within the valve gear. So you need to make sure that you bring it back up uh, as soon as you can if you don't need that power. So I hook it up pretty quick, and then the rest of it from there is just little adjustments of throttle getting speed going. Here we go! Ready to go. on the railroad it's a little bit of a roller coaster where you briefly go slightly down you kind of level out and it's a bit of a bowl shape and then you kind of work a little bit and then as you come around the sharp curve to the last switch for the run around it kind of steepens up a little bit more so running across the top is always a little bit interesting to try and find the happy spot where you just run nicely across. So there's a lot of fine adjustments that happen trying to get things nice and smooth across the top just because of how bumpy it is. It's really easy to get set and happy and get to equilibrium when you've got a set grade, a set curvature or anything like that. So when you're working uphill, boom, set the throttle, cool, we're good. But when you get all those little undulations in the track, you kind of have to mess with it a little bit and try and keep the speed the right way. So you'll watch as I play with the slop and the throttle trying to find that perfect little spot where the engine just lightly works so that as we go downhill, the cars stay in tension behind me. And as we work uphill, I still have enough power to keep it going and we don't have any train accordion going on. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And then when we get to the converging switch, that's pretty much the top of the railroad. That's all the way at the highest point, and then you go boom, straight down into about a three and a half or four percent grade on the on the steep side back down to the grade crossing. So you'll see at this point, shut the throttle, put the Johnson bar all the way in, in the corner again, so that you get as much travel in the valves and all the motions so that everything gets as much oil and wears evenly. And then I go after the automatic brake valve. And you'll see I hold the independent bailed with my left hand, which I actually don't think you need to do on the 20, but it's it's muscle memory from 346. I think if I remember right, Dusty and, and Jeff told me that 20 doesn't set up automatically when you leave it in run because she had some special modification from the RGS. Every locomotive is different because of course it is. But I hold it bailed anyways just in case so my engine and tender don't set up. And then I apply some on the train at about five pounds because that's really kind of what you need to start with to get the passenger cars to wake up and smell the coffee that you're trying to slow down. Huh? Oh yeah, we need to break? Okay. And then I wait a little bit, and then I take a little bit more. It's taken about a total of an eight PSI reduction, and that's because with the way that the brake rigging is set up on those passenger cars, um, you don't wanna to take too much more than about 10. Sometimes you'll end up getting sliding wheels because they're so light, because they're old and wooden, so you can't really get into a super deep set, and the deeper the set, the more wear you're putting on things. So I go for about eight pounds, and then I add just a little bit of that independent brake valve. You'll watch me dance it over just a little bit, and I'm popping it up just barely. It, it only gets maybe 10 or 15 pounds on it, and all that is is just enough to hold the own weight of the tender and engine back so that gravity is not affecting me as much. Uh, you actually, if you watch the coupler between the tender and the engine, they never go into buff. I'm never pressing against the cars, I'm just holding myself back. And then um, you'll watch me release it kind of slowly, and you'll hear it you'll hear the escape of air, and then finally when it fully exhausts, I'll hold it exhaust till it releases, and I'm just doing that so that in the event that I did come back at all, as I slowly release it, I don't all of a sudden then just dump everything off and then pff, yank the car a little bit further down the hill. The whole thing about train handling is trying to make sure that you get really small and precise adjustments rather than big changes all at once, because that's how you knock people on their butts, give people a bad ride, uh, or break something. So you try to avoid all that. But that's kind of a quick look at how we go around the museum, and you've probably heard enough from me, so let's listen to the engine work, shall we? <laughs>
As we're coming into the station, when we stop, we're working up about a percent, a quarter, percent and a half, somewhere in there, and a bit of a sharp curve. So we're working steam all the way up to the stop. But right before we stop, we make sure we get a nice set on the train to leave everything stretched. Turn on sand, so we make sure that we stop on sand so that whoever comes up after us doesn't have a hard time getting out of the station. We push the Johnson bar further into the corner so we don't have to have the throttle super far open. We don't want to be working a ton of steam. We just want to have the right amount of power to, to slow things down and cushion the pistons as we're coming into our stop. And also we want to have pretty precise control over when the engine goes to center. This is one of the really challenging nuances of stopping uphill, particularly with 20. It's got big drivers, a lot of boiler pressure, and uh, it doesn't have terribly much adhesion because it only has six drivers. If you just drag the train to a stop and just leave the throttle set and leave the brake set and you just work it until it literally stops itself based on what the train brakes are doing, you're gonna stop centered every time. And that means that only one side is able to apply power. And, and no steam engine wants to start on one side unless it's got a very light load behind it. But with the grade and the curve, you really don't want to stop centered if you can avoid it. So it's always a kind of the fun dance of 20 of get the train stretched behind you, work it nice and easy to a stop the best you can, and then kick the independent brake on right before it goes dead right before it stops on center because it'll stop on center every time because guess what one side stops outputting power you've got a bunch of weight behind you that's stretched oh okay that's where i stop right then so you want to catch it right before that kick the brake on and then you release the train to make sure that only the engine is holding the train on the grade so that people can get on and off without any worry of the cars moving if the air does anything wonky while you're sitting Bring the bar back to center, open the cylinder cock so you drain any water out. Of course, the throttle's already shut off by that point. Um, bring the headlight off because you're sitting, and, and that's that. Anyways guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this first person look at operating a steam locomotive from the engineer's seat and I hope you guys appreciated the little explanations and nuances that go into it because it's it's more than just pressing a couple buttons or setting things, there's a lot of little little nuance to it and a lot of feel things that you gotta understand how to do to, to really get there and it takes a fair amount of time to practice and, and get to that point. So I hope you guys enjoyed this look. As always, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, always helps, and uh, click the little bell if you want to see when these notifications pop up. I got, I got a bunch more videos along the lines of this one coming up for the future. So anyways guys, thank you so much for watching.